Welcome back. It's been a great deal of fun talking about Duboeuf wines and focusing on the Cru Beaujolais, but I do feel like we could do a better job explaining the story behind Georges Duboeuf and, and the wines that come from the, the family of Georges Duboeuf. Um, to do that, I probably need some help. I'm going to bring in Romain Teto, who has been with the family for well over a decade in France. So I've had the chance you know, to really get to, to work closely to him and to know him as, as a person, you know, beyond, beyond just the, the, the legend, the myth, and he's, he was just a, a great human being, a really good person. It's, uh, it's, it's funny how people have uh, ideas or preconceived ideas about people. I, I think the, the, best, uh, the best answer is in the glass, you know, you just... Uh, Open the bottle, taste the wine, and, and then you, 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 you choose for yourself what you want to decide, you know, what you like or what you don't like. So, uh, George was born in 1933 in Chantre, so in, in rural France. And his father passed away when George was three years old. So he was really brought up by his older brother, Roger, and his mother and the rest of the family. So he's, maybe his, his older brother acted as a father figure for George, and he always revered to, to Roger and always talked about Roger. But it's funny to see that these two brothers, very, very similar, but they two different paths. You know, Roger worked his entire life in the family estate, and George, uh, maybe the Chantre was too small for him. He had to conquer the world. So he, he really, um, he really started growing locally and made it a uh, worldwide um, brand or winery. We are judging from uh, nowadays standards. You know, the, the put back in perspective in 1930s, you know, most most schools in France. You know, I I I, I have a, a picture actually in one book of George at school. Uh, and he has wooden shoes, but all the kids have wooden shoes. You know, that was the 1930s in rural France, so that was kind of the the norm at the time. For example, uh, they were not equipped with uh, electricity until uh, after World War II. So I think he had a, a hardworking um, childhood, childhood, but also a, a very a, a strong sense of work ethic that she's got. Uh, he got from his uh, family, his older brother, and that's really something he kept in his entire life. And George often say that that one of the best vintage he can remember was 1947. So he was already making wine in 1947. And the reason he remembers that uh, is because, you know, that was a very warm, a very warm vintage. And in Chantre, if you say making white wine, you wanted to maintain a cool, te cool temperature during fermentation. And uh, they, were, they were not equipped with bats that uh, temperature control. So he had to take his bike to his bicycle and go to, to Macon, the nearest town, buy blocks of ice and bringing them back to the winery to wrap it around the fermenting tank just to, to maintain the, the temperature. So that's, that tells you that first, you know, I do that, go back and forth with his bike is... Uh, is there is something to be ready for the Tour de France, but also uh, it shows you, you know, they were not equipped with, with modern equipment at the time. And, and he, uh, he was there in 1947 already working in, in, in Vignan. Uh, so, you know, so really Georges Duboeuf, back to his childhood, uh, was really different than the, the rest of the, uh, the children, the rest of the crowd. You see, he was uh, thinking differently. For example, he told, he told me once that most of the people uh, harvesting at the, at the winery were using small um, metal baskets that sometimes had rust. And George thought that was not good to the integrity of, of, uh, of the, the grapes. So he decided to use straw baskets. And that's the little thing that makes you know, the, the difference in, um, in winemaking. So working in the vineyard, he was not only working in the vineyard as a, as a wine grower or a winemaker, but really he was a farm boy. You see, he, he, he had to, 
to know how to work a vineyard, but also to grow vegetables and and, and maybe take care of the of the cattle and and uh, doing all that at the at the family. So he was a farm boy. He it's he was both a, a vintner and a farmer at the same time. I would I would say from a young age. Apparently, he could fix machines too. Apparently, he could even do that. I don't know what he was not doing. You see, uh, Josh could do everything uh, from uh, from drawing labels to to tasting wine, to promoting the wine, to to working on machines and equipment. He was actually like a um, um, in French we would say a touche to so a touch everything. It means he was touching every uh, every aspect of the art. But you see. Um, George, actually, wine and becoming a vintner was a second career. It was not his first choice. He wanted to be a, a sports teacher. Oh, really? No, I yes, didn't realize that. He went to Paris. He went to Paris to become a sports teacher, but he had a back injury, and he had to go back to to uh, to his um, to his winery. And actually, that's a, a second career wine. That's just because he failed. He failed being a, a sports teacher that he, he became a, um, a winemaker. So it's, it's actually a, a good second career. Yes, and also he was always, always thinking of, way to, uh, of new ways to fix something. And that's maybe that's what set him apart from his uh, contemporaries, uh, contemporaries from, from, from the rest, because he was thinking outside the box. You know, just to give you uh, an idea, like at the time, you know, we are right after World War II. Most of the domains and chateaus in puy fusse are not equipped with bottling line. So what it means is that you know, you're making your wine and there comes the time where the negociants come to your estate with a, with a tank and they pump, your, they pump your, your vats, your wine, and put it inside the tank and then they go to the next if you say domain and they do the same thing until they fill up the tank so what it means is that you're losing the sense of place because your terroirs are uh, blended with other terroirs you're losing your identity as a winemaker uh, you're also losing money and you're losing your name because only the name of the, 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 the negociant is on the label. So George was thinking, okay, how can I do things differently? And he, what he, he came up with is an idea of, of buying an old truck. Actually, that, that truck, I don't know if you've seen that picture, but uh, that truck is, was a, um, a truck that you use for, uh, radio, for X-rays. So medical supply truck going to remote places in Beaujolais and Maconnais. And he bought that, converted it into a moving bottling line. This way he was able to go to the estates of Puy Fusse and bottle the wine at the estate. You know, what was not the case before. Um, and that's really, really how he started. So you know, uh, a lot of people think of George Duboeuf as a negociant, as a negociant brand, but really the what got us started, you know, we are uh, domain, we are family estate domain, and we started representing small family owned uh, domains and chateaus of Puy Fusse and later Beaujolais. And only as we grew, we started blending wine together under a negociant label. But really, the DNA of George Duboeuf is the respect of the origin, the, uh, the respect of the families of vintners, of winemakers, and really trying to stay as small as we can and keep small cuvee with real reflection of the terroir and, and the vintner. Yeah, as I say, for, for you know, older uh, uh, drinkers like myself, somebody who's been around uh, uh, Debo for a long time, you know, the, the Jean de, Com de Scombe, Morgan was like a revelation when, when we first saw that years ago, because it was, it was this single estate, this one producer, Dubuff was, was bottling it uh, for the family. And, and we just sort of fell out of our shoes at the time because we'd never seen anything like that. That was new for us. And you see a lot of people 
realize that at least people in Beaujolais know that, you know, uh, when you saw uh, when George passed, the entire region went to went to the church, you know, for the, the ceremony. So Le Chapon Fin was very close uh, to 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 Chantre. Uh, you know, if you if you take your car or if you ride the bicycle like Georges Duboeuf, it's maybe a little longer. But he that at the time, you know, Le Chapon Fin was. Uh, what, one of the most famous uh, restaurants and uh, the, the, the great place of the, the new cuisine in, in, uh, in France. And uh, Paul Blanc really embraced the personality of Georges Duboeuf and his wines. And Paul Blanc introduced him to many chefs. To, to this day, you know, we were still working with Georges Blanc. Uh, so it's a, it's a relationship that, that's still going on. So George was a very loyal person, especially to those who help, helped him. And the first name that would always come up was, was uh, Alexis Lichy. Uh, and for Paul Bocuse, it was more, uh, it was loyalty, but also a uh, very big friendship. So uh, Alexis Lichy met George in the 60s and liked his Puy Fusé, so he was the first to import his Puy Fusé to the, US, to the US. And at the time, Alexis Lichin said there is one condition to import uh, wines, you, it has to be bottled at the estate. And that's really how Georges started representing small family estates in Beaujolais and Maconnais to provide Alexis Lichin with estate bottled wine. So he really, Alexis Lichin was really the, the first to, to believe in Georges Duboeuf. So Alexis was very, very important for, for Georges. And for, you know, we're in the 1960s, um, for a, a young, hardworking winemaker like Georges Duboeuf, seeing his wine in New York, in, in Washington, in Chicago, in, in places like that was a dream come true. Really. Paul was really the, the, the friendship of, of his life. Um, and uh, see, they were, they were vacation, uh, going on vacation together, uh, making pranks on each other, um, always cutting each other. Uh, they were really like best friends. Really best friends. So really together, they brought Beaujolais to the world. Uh, you had the two arms of, of French uh, uh, art of living. Uh, you had the gastronomy with Paul Bocuse and the wine with Georges Duboeuf. And together they traveled along the, around the world, really promoting the French uh, lifestyle and cuisine and, and gastronomy and wine. Paul Bocuse was more outgoing, oh, yeah. exuberant, and larger than life, and uh, George was more discreet, more low key, uh, you know, very soft spoken and very delicate and uh, with attention to detail. But together, they, they, they made a, a, great, um, a great pair of friends. And George Duboeuf could taste some, somewhere between 400 to 500 samples per day with his team. Uh, we're talking 500 samples of Gamay from the same appellation on the same day. And being able to really find the gems, find the very best wines out of these samples is not given to, to a lot of people. And George was, was one of them. We didn't have a relationship with his father, but uh, I can say he always uh, refer, refer to the, the persons or the Duboeuf before him uh, and because when you inherit a land that's been in your family's hand for over 400 years maybe 500, 500 years you want to take care of it okay you want to add your personality but you also want to respect it and give it to the next generation in the very best possible conditions so I think uh, George 
saw himself as a um, as one person in the line of the debuff, passing the, you say passing the baton uh, to the next generation. And I've been I, I've been um, fortunate to travel with them too, and you really can see that very strong bond. You know, sometimes you have a generation of the same family; they don't talk to each other. Here, they they spend maybe 40 years working uh, six feet apart you know, uh, from each other and always sharing ideals together. So they really work together. So when you see uh, George pass to the next generation, that was actually a very long process. And Frank had been involved in every single aspect of the business for the last uh, 30 to 40 years before being fully responsible of the company. So it's a slow transition. Uh, Frank really uh, lives for wine, just like his dad. Uh, and that's what drives him every day. He loves wine. He is he's a very, very good taster. He's very delicate and has a very, a very good palate. Uh, and also, uh, I've been to tasting with Frank. He would not speak too much, taste wine and say, okay, Romain, go at that booth and taste that wine or taste that wine and very open-minded. And I would describe his palate as very delicate and, uh, and elegant. And he's, he's really tr slowly moving the, the style of Dubuff in this direction. So it's not a, a revolution, it's more evolution and, and really it reflects his own palate. And as the term of personality, uh, he's also, you see, fr Frank, you can see him uh, in, in vineyards, talk to the vigneron, talk the same language. Um, he's not like a, a CEO who only spends his time in, in his office, you know, where he's really there at the winery. So the philosophy of Dubuff is really passed on generation to generation. First and foremost, they are winemakers. They are vintners. And then the other aspect, those are responsibility comes after. It's, you see, having a, a father figure like, th like that uh, must be, you know, a, um, a blessing. You see, a blessing to have someone like, like, uh, like, like George. And also, uh, you have to live up to the, to the standards that are pretty high. And just like his dad, you know, his father was the first at the, at the office. Uh, Frank is the same. We respect the legacy of his father and continue working uh, for the legacy of his father. He says that's great. You no, know, I was I was that person in the nineteen sixties uh, or or seventies, um, and every region needs new um, new young uh, passionate. Uh, domains to promote the region. So he always saw that not as a competition, but as a, a great way to continue to promote Beaujolais. So in a very positive way, and he say, you know, I see new young 20 years old winemakers in Beaujolais trying to promote their wine. That's great. That's who I was. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I applaud that uh, new generation. Thank you for watching and thank you for joining us on this uh, journey through various aspects of Beaujolais, Cru Beaujolais, and most importantly, the wines of the family of Georges de Boeuf. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the videos. We certainly hope you've had some enjoyable drinks along the way, because if you haven't, what have you been doing? I mean, come on, that's the whole point of this thing, right? So please, a vote la santé, cheers, and enjoy yourselves. Mm -hmm.